Players earn 2 million euros a week. Matchdays have 10 different kickoff times. Clubs loan out more than 50 players at once. How could it come this far? Well, it began exactly 30 years ago. Do you remember 1991? No? People dressed like this and did this to their hair. The best footballer at that time was Jean-Pierre Papin. He also earned 2 million, but in a year. Red Star Belgrade ruled Europe. What? League matches were all played on the same day at the same time, but almost never shown live on TV. <laughs> Clubs and players were not global brands. Kids in Asia and Africa didn't wear jerseys of Van Basten, Matthäus or Lineker. I mean, football didn't make any money in those days. In most leagues, you could only have two foreigners in your squad. So, no French connection in London, no Galacticos in Madrid, and no Tiki Taka in Munich. But that was the last year of the old football. In 1992, modern football, as we know it today, was born. 92 is kind of the, the BC AD moment. Why? Well, there are three major changes that all unbelievably happened in the same year. So now we are in the summer of 92. People wore this and did this to their hair. Denmark didn't qualify for the Euros, but somehow won them anyway. And there was another thing that happened at the Euros 92 in Sweden. The German businessman Klaus Hempel met the English composer Tony Britton and asked him to write a classical song, maybe something inspired by Hempel. Britton wasn't very creative. He took the song they already used for crowning English monarchs. made the lyrics a little more banal. Okay, back to Klaus Hempel. He was tasked by UEFA to create a premium international competition that would attract more money than the old European Cup. Good evening and welcome to the European League. His concept was to bundle the TV and sponsorship rights for all European participants in one hand. Hits. Individual countries could no longer decide which sponsors to put on the edge of the pitch or at what time games kicked off. They had to swallow it. Hempel thought of names like Super Tour, Champions Cup, Champions Tour, in the end Champions League 1. He chose prime time for kickoffs, which was, as a continental compromise, 8.45 CET. The TV stations and the advertising industry loved it. Soon, the money flooded in. Sport y Continental. TV money rose from 85 million Swiss francs in 92 to 1 billion in 2002. Now, it's about 2.5 billion euro. And by introducing group stages instead of just knockout games, top clubs had far more guaranteed matches. That was different before. Uh, Champions Cup and now Champions all of the top teams play at least six matches. Plus they have a high chance of reaching the knockout stage because the pot system splits the top teams and puts weaker sides in each group. So the result of Klaus Hempel's idea was an explosion of international TV money, a widening gap between the rich and the poor and a shift of focus from national to continental competition. So, still 1992. As if the introduction of the Champions League wasn't enough, there was another major change in European football that year. It began in England in 1991. The so-called Big Five at that time, Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool, Tottenham and Everton, were sick of playing in the first division. Why? It was really quite a grim situation. Uh, you had sort of a collision of, of problems. One was hooliganism. Um, which had seen the English clubs banned from Europe. You had unsafe stadiums. And most importantly, football didn't make any money in those days. Today, the world's most popular football league, English football hasn't always looked like a sleek marketing machine. All the international stars went to Spain or Italy. No one went to England. And even British stars went abroad. Mark Hughes and Gary Lineker to Barcelona, Ian Rush to Juventus. English clubs were not attractive for sponsors. And there was basically no TV money from the FA. Man United got the same TV money as a fourth division team. 
1992 changed all of that because of a group of insightful young executives who had looked at America and saw something they really liked. Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Gumbel. He's Terry Bradshaw, and we welcome you. In the NFL, they actually realized, hang on, we're not in the custodian business. We're in the entertainment business. And so fans are also customers. So club after club followed the idea of the Big Five and finally founded a community based on the model of big English business enterprises, an autonomous league with the right to market itself. The name? The Premier League. An Australian media mogul saw a chance to make English football a global brand. Rupert Murdoch's Sky won the rights to broadcast Premier League games live from 1992 by closing a five-year, 300 million pound deal. Next Monday, only on Sky Sports. Good evening to you. Manchester City and Queen's Park Rangers tonight, marking the start of a whole new era. Suddenly, it was a whole different, uh, as they said, a whole new ball game. Um, the production value was completely different. Uh, it, you know, Crystal Palace had cheerleaders. Um, previously, a football game on TV, uh, you know, the, the broadcast would start five minutes before kickoff and immediately after the final whistle, they'd be done. Now, on Sky, they were dealing with four and five hours of programming on, on Super Sunday, as they called it. And I think a lot of what we see on television today, tactics boards and panels of analysts, ex-players in suits discussing things, and uh, that's all really from then. So pay TV took over in 1992. Other countries followed that example in the 90s. The consequences? English clubs had far more money, their matches were shown in Thailand and Brazil, they refurbished their stadiums, and above all, they bought players. The new era began with the arrival of Eric Cantona in 92. Arsenal signed Dennis Bergkamp in 95 from Inter Milan for over 11 million euros, which was incredible at that time. In 96, Chelsea bought Zola, Viali and Di Matteo, all from Serie A. The tide turned. By the beginning of the new millennium, Manchester United spent their TV money on stars like Van Nistelrooy and Juan Sebastian Verón. The Premier League had become the richest and most attractive league in the world, a role model for most of the other leagues. In 1991, no one would have thought that. I like big butts and I cannot lie. So we have the start of the Champions League, the start of the Premier League and the breakthrough of pay TV in 1992. But there's one more thing that is at least as important as those three other major developments. On February 7th, 1992, the Treaty of Maastricht was signed. The foundation of today's European Union. How did that affect football? Well, the Treaty of Maastricht allows every EU citizen to live and work where they want across the EU. Construction workers, craftsmen and merchants migrated by the thousands. Footballers were a little different at first. Clubs could reject a player's wish to move by demanding high transfer fees, even when the contract had ended. The Belgian player John Mark Bosman felt this situation did not comply with freedom of movement. And judges thought so too. This led to the famous Bosman ruling of 1995. The consequences? Players could transfer for free after the end of their contract. Clubs offer contracts of five years or more today. And salaries are raised much more often. The other effect was the high-speed internationalization of football. League after league got rid of the limits on foreign players. In 1998, Arsenal had nine Frenchmen in their squad. Plus a Nigerian, an Argentinian, a Swede, a Portuguese, an Austrian, a Spaniard, and two Dutchmen. Oh, and a French coach, of course. Today, around 60% of players in all the top leagues are foreign. All because of the events of 1992. Today, we live in an era that began in 1992. Corona has tweaked things, but has certainly not led to a change of direction. How far can it go? Top matches are already aired in 200 countries. There are not many more than that on the planet. In the Premier League, we already have 10 different kickoff times per match day. Kids in Tonga, Vietnam and Kenya wear a Spanish club's shirts with a Portuguese player's name on the back. 
There's still room for expansion though. If they can pay this for Neymar today, why not this for someone else tomorrow? Amazon is now conquering live football rights. Let's see what other tech giants have in store. 1992 opened Pandora's box. There is a before 92, and that seems almost like it's in black and white to us today. Post 92 is really the, the beginning of football as a business. Will football ever leave this path? 